welcome and good morning. The 2022 Business Summit is halfway through, uh, bringing us this Wednesday. Um, on behalf of your Peterborough and the Kawarthas Chamber of Commerce, we are honored again this year to partner with Peterborough and the Kawarthas Economic Development to bring you all all week long, the Business Summit. Uh, so please take a moment today, follow our sponsors on social media, check out our panelists on social media as well. Uh, you can find lots of helpful content coming down the pipeline. Um, a big shout out to our summit sponsor, the Business Development Bank of Canada, BDC, uh, makes this event possible every year for us to move forward and equip small, medium businesses with tools to be successful on the other side. So the theme this year, of course, is forward thinking. Uh, big shout out to our profile sponsor, Nexicom, and our knowledge sponsors, Peterborough Microwage Whitby. No, I just said that backwards. Big shout out to our knowledge sponsor, Microwage Peterborough Whitby, um, and Lynn Woodcroft, Royal LePage Frank Real Estate. Thank you so much for joining us today a finance panel discussion, a discussion for today's small business owners. Let me introduce you to my really good friend and partner in crime, uh, Hillary Mannion. Hillary is an entrepreneurship officer at the Business Advisory Center for Peterborough and the Kawartha's Economic Development. Her commitment to lo the local community has been shown during her time as a founding member of the Peterborough Tool Library. Hillary is also uh, on the board of directors for the Peterborough Folk Festival. On a personal level, Hillary is very familiar with the demands of small businesses, work-life balance as required as an entrepreneur. She's a true gem to this community. Welcome Hillary Mannion, who is moderating our discussion today. Thank you, Tiffany, very, very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Peter Rowan and Cortez Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event and uh, asking me to moderate. Uh, today, our panelists are going to be discussing all things small business finance. Uh, we are hoping to touch on maybe forecasting and devising a plan on how to move forward. So uh, Tiffany and I will be watching the chat. So if you'd like to ask questions, please put them in the chat. We can get to them at the end, um, or you can send them directly to me if you'd like me to ask them anonymously. We're hoping to get to as many as possible. So first today, I'd like to do a quick introduction of our panelists. Um, Heather Hallahan is an experienced professional with the Business Development Bank of Canada. She has dedicated the last seven years to supporting local entrepreneurs with financing and advisory solutions with the purpose of growing their business. Heather has found her niche after spending close to 15 years in the financial services industry. As an advocate for Canadian entrepreneurship and innovation, Heather is a relationship builder who brings a wealth of knowledge to further position businesses for local and global success. In her spare time, Heather can most likely be found exploring the outdoors with her husband and two daughters. Thank you, Heather, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Jeff, Jeff Lingard is from Inclusive Advisory. Jeff is a Peterborough native and has been in public accounting for over 20 years, earning his CPA in 2003. Jeff specializes in financial statements and income tax preparation for owner-managed businesses. Jeff completed the CPA Canada In-Depth Taxation Program in 2010 and assists his clients with various tax, uh, succession, and estate planning matters. Jeff, thank you. Thank you. And Gwyneth James uh, has been a senior partner at Cody and James Chartered Professional Accountants since 2009. She also serves as the corporate controller for Peterborough and the Quartha's economic development in a part-time role. Prior to this, she was controller and manager of business development at Nexicom for 11 years. Ms. James has a wealth of volunteer experience in the Peterborough community, having held over a dozen positions over the past 20 years. And she currently serves on the Peterborough Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and Executive Committee. Gwyneth, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. So that being said, I think we can dive right into our discussion. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, the small business finances and, and things that we've seen in the, um, the small business world in the last few years. So one of the things that we have seen is that many small and medium sized businesses took on new debt through 2020 and into 2021. So whether it was SIBA or other loans. So these were for the most part unexpected and unplanned for most business owners. So 
We're seeing, but now we're seeing businesses wanting to capitalize on opportunities to expand or acquire assets. So while we want to be cautious of additional debt load and also increasing interest rates, I'm hoping that you can share some key factors that business owners can keep in mind as they consider new financing. Um, Heather, from your perspective at BDC, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I think initially, you know, in 2020, we saw at the, the initial lockdowns, a lot of almost like panic borrowing from the, our clients and, and other businesses in the community, uh, whether it was through SEBA or some of the financing we provided or through other sources, uh, there was this fear of unknown and wanting to secure some sort of working capital to weather whatever storm might be coming. Uh, it, certainly for us, we sort of looked at financing loans that would provide businesses with six months, give or take, of operating expenses to make sure they could just keep their doors open uh, if the lockdowns continued longer than expected. And I think what what came about is as businesses started to reopen, perhaps a little bit earlier than they expected, or they were able to continue generating revenue, um, what some of what we've seen is that there was actually, they may not have needed the borrowing. Uh, and then they've been able to actually use that as to an advantage for their for their business to help grow it. So maybe you got some excess funding that you know, you didn't actually need for operating and just keeping your doors open, but it allowed you to maybe make some new arrangements with a supplier or se secure a new uh, piece of equipment or invest in some technology that helped your business um, diversify or uh, pivot during, during some of the lockdowns. Um, some of the key points I would say um, to moving forward, or if you're continuing to look at borrowing to support some growth or expansion within your business is knowing and understanding your cash flow. I think my accountant friends here <laughs> would agree that cash is king. And if you don't have a good understanding of what the cash flow needs are for your business now, but in a month from now, in three months from now, layering in additional debt uh, can, can be advantageous, but it could also be damaging if you don't have a good understanding of what that cash flow is and how you're going to pay it back. Um, so being able to understand that cash flow forecast lets you make really educated decisions on how you can use that debt to advance your business. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Um, Jeff, as a CPA, is there anything you'd like to add about, you know, what businesses need to keep in mind as they may be considering new financing? Heather had some great points there, especially on the cash flow side. Uh, one thing is if it's an asset acquisition, uh, you can talk with about tax write-offs. Like there's been a lot of the last few federal budgets have allowed for accelerated depreciation for tax purposes. So that's something that when you're factoring in, well, what's my tax shield from buying this asset? You can count, we can, accounts can help you calculate that. The only issue there when you're talking about your cash flow is when do I get my taxes back? Well, not till after you file your next tax return, right? So it's not going to be something where you're getting a check back for that tax shield right away. Um, so that's a big one uh, just for tax implications that way. Well, that leads into what I was going to ask next really nicely. So um, we've talked about, you know, the current debt that people may have and business owners. So, um, you know, a lot of these business also business owners, excuse me, also took advantage of the government subsidies and funding that were available throughout um, 2020 and 2021. And we're continuing to see a few more programs launch now. So I'm wondering if there is anything that we should be aware of in terms of imp tax implications for you know this and future years when it comes to or our taxes, future borrowing when it for these subsidies and fundings. Um, Gwyneth, from I know that you mentioned you have something to say on this one. Yeah, I think a lot of people had forgotten that most of those grants had at least a partial taxable component to them. So for example, anything that's forgivable or a grant is going to need to be included in your income and you're going to have to pay tax on that. 
For corporations, it's not as huge a hit, but for a sole proprietor who took on, for example, a SIBA loan and ended up with 10 or $20,000 of forgivable debt, which now became income, which they also had to pay CBP premiums of over 11% on, that caused a huge tax hit that they had not accounted for at all. So uh, that's the thing people need to understand is that there is going to be a tax implication to any free monies that you receive. And so, you know, make sure that, for example, when you are spending those monies that you're spending them on expenses so that you're offsetting that additional income with an expense as much as you can. Um, but just be very mindful of that uh, pending tax liability. Jeff, I'm wondering um, if you have anything to add as you sort of implied earlier. Yeah, we've, we've had some interesting conversations with clients about, oh, wait, that wage subsidy was taxable or things along those lines. Um, one thing with uh, the SEBA, if you can't repay that loan by the end of 2023 and you, ha you start making the monthly payments, then you'll be able to take a deduction for the amounts that you included in income in the past. Um, but hopefully you can either refinance that so you can keep your that forgivable portion and uh, if you're looking at like as grants and subsidies come out you don't always have to include an income if you get a grant for helping purchase an asset or something from a local government or something along those lines you can reduce the cost of the asset instead of including it in income excellent thank you so we mentioned earlier, and I think this is something that I know in clients what I deal with um, at the Business Advisory Center is cash flow. Heather, you mentioned cash is king. So it can be difficult to manage, especially for smaller businesses or sole proprietors. So now we're in times of fluctuating, increasing costs, including wage increases. We have an unpredictable supply chain. Um, and now some of our businesses have new debt repayment that we discussed. So managing the cash in and out of your business is key. I'm hoping that the three of you can maybe share some of your best practices in terms of being able to keep on top of it and understanding your cash flows. Heather, would you like to start? Yeah, I think, you know, especially in what when we're looking at because i'm looking at financing requests on a on a daily basis um, the biggest hindrance sometimes to getting a loan authorization from just application to actually approved is being able to communicate effectively to your banker um, the financial information that you have and so part a big part of a loan authorization forms on when and how you can repay a loan and if you don't have that ability, those good financial controls in place within your business, whether it's somebody in house or a trusted partner who you work with at an accounting firm or um, and you don't have the ability to provide that information, it makes it really hard as a lender to be able to say, yes, we think that you can pay us back. Um, so really having good controls around your, again, your cash flow forecasting and your budgeting to be able to demonstrate how and when that's going to happen. But so that's from a lending perspective. But even if you don't need lending, um, having those controls in place allow you to make strategic decisions for your business in a really educated way and let you understand if the benefit, you know, you can run those cost benefit analysis. You can say, is it worth taking on this debt? Is it worth buying this asset? What is that gonna look like for my business in three months, six months at my year end? And is it worth it? Um, mm -hmm. So that's like everything I say, and uh, you know, in terms of speaking with clients is making sure that you have a good understanding and good financial controls in place. Thank you very much. Gwyneth. Um, from your role as a CPA, what, what, what are some of your best practices that you try to, you know, share with your clients? Well, I don't think I'm going to say anything new, but uh, I get the floor because it, what I'm going to say is that I tell people, whatever you do, do not use your cash to buy a long-term asset because cash is king and you need cash flow. You need that safety net. And so if you're buying an asset, either look for a debt that kind of matches roughly the life of the asset, you know, a vehicle, five to seven years, 
get a loan five, seven years, or use leasing. There are a lot of really good leasing programs out there uh, that you don't actually have to lease with the place you bought the equipment for. You can actually turn around and get a lease. I, I'm not even sure if BDC doesn't do capital leases, do you? No? Okay. But I do know that there are financial institutions that do. And so that, again, spreads the cash flow out over a period of time and protects your, your short-term cash flow that you might need for jumps in operating expenses or opportunities and other things. Use a line of credit for short-term, very short-term uh, cash flow challenges where you all of a sudden, you know, this money's coming in, but you need to spend this, you need to pay this first, use your line of credit, then pay it off. Uh, don't leave monies on line of credit, that's short-term. Um, and then the other thing I was gonna say was under no circumstances do you use a credit card for any debt at all. The rates are way, way too high. They're only gonna get worse. Um, you obviously use a credit card, but please make sure you're paying that thing off every month or you're going to get underwater very, very quickly. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, that's great points. One thing I know as someone who has owned a small business is a lot of this stuff is just finding time to do it. And <laughs> Like, like it is like you're so busy in your business, it's hard to find the time. So I would suggest as kind of a life hack is schedule a meeting with yourself, you know, on a regular basis to make sure you're seeing how your business is doing because it, it happens to everybody. Like I'm an accountant. It, it's happened to me where I'm like, oh yeah, where, how am I doing this month? You know, where I have to like kind of set an hour aside. So it's more on the... The, the balance, like the life side, yeah. Make sure you take the time to do it and and bring people in to help you out. And that's that's where I go there. Excellent. Those are all really great points. And I'm going to keep them in the back of my head for when my clients come to me and ask about cash flow. <laughs> so with managing cash flow on our minds, um, we all see it. We know that inflation is wreaking havoc on businesses. Um, everywhere. So aside from the rising costs that we've mentioned, um, I am wondering if any of you know, are there things that maybe aren't on our radar right now that small businesses should be aware of in the coming months? Um, Heather, I don't know if you have yeah, any. Yeah. So I, when, when uh, I was thinking about this question, I think something to consider is knowing what your risks are relative to your supply chain mm -hmm. and you know is somebody in your supply chain in a really challenged spot what's happening in that industry that could trickle down and affect you in maybe a few months from now right is and right. then what can you do can you diversify your supply chain network can you arrange for different supplier terms to maybe secure some additional product up front if you see that there is something coming down the pipe that might have an impact to you later. Uh, and I would say the same even with your client base. You know, is there a risk for any of your customers that maybe won't be a customer uh, because of some of these impacts? How does that, if you lose a key account, what does that look like for your revenue? And, and really more importantly, your bottom line, because revenue is revenue, but if you're not making any money, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, and mm -hmm. you're doing work for nothing, right? So taking a look at both of those, you know, your accounts payable and your accounts receivable basically and saying, where is my risk here? Uh, and how do I mitigate it? That's, the, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm wondering if you can add to that or if you have anything that you can think of. Sorry, it kind of cut out for a second. You said me or Gwyneth? Oh, yourself, Jeff. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Sorry, me, it's me. Yeah, well, timing is a big thing right now. I've had a couple of clients where I was looking at their December year statements. I'm like, why is your inventory up so high? And they, what they'd done is they had bought parts because they were able to lock in parts before costs went up. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping careful look on your pricing is big because I know a lot of people don't update their pricing as quickly as their costs go up and they're always playing catch up. So it might be something where you're trying to match and stay on top of that, communicate with clients. 
Uh, that's the big thing as I'm seeing anyway. Excellent, thank you. Um, those are great points. I don't know, Gwyneth, is there anything that you'd like to add? Just one very small one. Uh, both of those guys did great, get, had great points. The only thing I was going to leap off of what Jeff had said was that, you know, wage costs continue to increase, not just minimum wage, which of course is increasing. So make sure you're staying on top of that. But because minimum wage increases, everything else kind of starts to increase as well. And you want to keep your good staff. So you want to give them a little bit more money. Well, you need to make sure you're recovering that. You know, there, there are fancy little soft, you know, sort of stand in numbers you can use to say, okay, if you are paying somebody $20 an hour, you should be billing them out at $50 an hour, for example. So watch your, your pricing and make sure that you're recovering the time of your staff so that you're able to, you know, give them the wage they deserve and you don't lose some of those key staff. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but um, we've seen it in the news and I saw it in my mortgage renewal, uh, the interest rates are going up. So what does that mean for, you know, um, best practices when it comes to servicing debt and potentially borrowing for new investments? So uh, Heather, I don't know if you want, would you like to leave this one? Yeah, Sure. Uh, I'm going to say it again, it comes right back to cash flow and being able to forecast and understanding, you know, what, if you are taking on new debt, what does that look like for your business, for the time, uh, for the amount of time that you're taking that loan? And if it is for a new investment, what is that like cost benefit analysis in, in taking on that debt? And at what point does it not become profitable, right? Or does it not create any benefit for your operations to consider carry that carrying that I mean certainly there's strategies around choosing the appropriate amortization um, you know when we structure loans we really look at um, optimizing the repayment schedule around the cash flow of the business so if you are making a new investment in say some technology but you won't reap that benefit for six months you know try and get financing that is tailored to when you will actually recognize that profitability and that investment in the technology versus paying for it upfront. Um, and uh, the other parts is, you know, looking at whether you fix a rate or stay floating, kind of doing some, again, it comes down to those financial metrics and being able to understand how that translates into your business. Maybe it makes sense to fix your rate and tie it to the, the sort of the timeline of the project. But, you know, if your cash flow can sustain it, maybe it makes sense to stay floating because that's a lower interest rate. So having good conversations with the professionals who are around you to make sure you're making the best decision is, I would say, key. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, Gwyneth, when you have a client who is looking at, you know, servicing debt or borrowing, borrowing again, um, what could you share with them as best practices? I think Heather pretty much captured most of what I would say to a client. I can't think of anything else. It's it's really critical that they they don't get so in love with the idea that they lose sight of whether it will actually make them money. You know, and that, that I I do have that. Uh, I'm sure Jeff and Heather have run into this where you've got somebody who's just so excited about their bright idea and you're like, I don't want to rain on your parade, but I just don't see what you're seeing. And have you really, really, you know, stepped back and looked at what is the possibility of profitability? What, you know, what is the market? Are you actually going to be able to charge what you need to charge to be able to make a profit at this? And so, yeah, sometimes I, I find myself in the unfortunate position of saying I, I don't see it <laughs> and, and I need you to, to explain this to me because I'm not as excited about it as you are and and that I think is is the hardest role that we we play <laughs> I would say going to add on to that like another piece that comes up a lot is not having the correct infrastructure in place in your business to execute on a project so it's great you've got this new great idea but if you don't have the key people or the time or the resources available to execute then it's kind of doomed from the beginning so making sure that 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 work is done ahead of time before you take the leap yeah yeah absolutely you, you know I, 
I, I came up with this saying that your business should be more like a child that will eventually be independent than a pet that will never be. So you have to make sure that you are setting up that structure in place that eventually that business will almost run without you. Jeff alluded to this when he said, you got to take that time to work on your business and not be constantly buried in it. You, you just can really lose sight sometimes of the of the end goal and of, of the metrics and of the profitability and how things are going because you're just so busy pedaling as fast as you can and not stepping back and looking at how how well is this business actually growing and am I creating something that's going to provide some future benefit and be able to afford all of this debt that I'm taking on and things like that. And and with some with some increases like, like we're actually seeing rates going up like stress tests aren't a bad idea like when you're doing when you're saying okay i'm going to buy this piece of equipment it's a floating rate what happens if it if that rate goes up by two percent over the next three years or four years or something along those lines like we haven't had to worry about stress tests as much the last couple of years with rates staying low but it's something to think about oh. and your short-term borrowing as well i don't think people think of it that way like on their lines of credits and things like that they're usually floating rates so mm -hmm. that becomes more expensive excellent thank you um so what i'm hearing is plan planning 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 right okay Thing that I talk about with the clients at the business advisory centers. You have to have that foundation of a plan before you make any big decisions. So that's good to know. Um, another question that I actually had brought to me before the panel was um, about the fluctuations that we're seeing in things like supply chain and even our utilities and our raw goods. So with the so the per, the person the question that I was given was that the prices of everything are changing constantly. And how do I manage my business's finances when over the span of a couple months, something like shipping costs have quadrupled from some suppliers? So what are some of the things from your perspectives? What can a business do to plan for a successful year end when they might not know what their costs will be? And I'm going to, I'll leave that to you. And that's maybe you can. <laughs> I, I think a big part of it is customer communication. Like where, like if you're setting contracts for sales terms or uh, things like that, like it's, I have to look at my contracts and say, what do they say? Like, is there a provision to increase costs for shipping costs? Um, I think, and being direct and forward with customers and upfront with customers is like, you know, this is a quote, right? It doesn't mean like if things come up, like I know, We've had a lot of fun with contracting clients. Gwen has probably seen this a lot where, hey, you quoted to do my fence two years ago at this price. Why can't you keep it at the same price? And it's like, well, look at the price of lumber right now. Uh, I think that's what you can do. Like, that's a big thing is just to be up front and kind of keep yourself lean and mean that way. And so that you're flexible and the clients know. And I find most of the time the clients understand in this in this case like they know costs are going up they're charging more uh, so it, it's something to think about all quotes should have a life span they should never be kind of you know even a two-year a two-year quote is ridiculous you never would do that three months at the most and then mm -hmm. you've quoted based on maybe some inventory that you uh, managed to build up because it was on sale and you know you can afford to do the quote for that amount because you've got the material for that amount but don't go too far out with that because you know you're eventually going to have to replenish that inventory and it may be a lot higher yeah yeah we've i've even seen some quotes as short as you know two to three days if it's commodity based um, where you know the you know the your business isn't carrying that inventory, you've got to go out into the open market and purchase it. So they're basically transferring along however long their quote for the materials for that job might be, is how long the client gets. And if they can't lock it in for them to be able to make that purchase, then that quote's no longer good. So I think that you need to be agile and and sort of working with what the market that you're servicing. And the, and the challenges that it's experiencing, you can't just do things the same way mm -hmm. because that's the way you've always done it. You have to be able to look at situations and make decisions. And like Jeff said, like keeping an eye on your costing and your pricing and how your contracts are built are key to 
sort of keeping your profitability. And I would say even like the other side of that is looking with your suppliers, like are there supplier discounts? If your cash, again, if your cash flow forecasting says that you could carry and you could buy a, a bulk purchase of some inventory and you can carry it for the next six or eight months for however long it takes you to sell through that, and you might get a five, a 10, a 15% discount for paying for that upfront, then again, knowing if your cash flow can support it, because you don't want to do it if in three months from now, you're going to be at your max on your operating line and worried about payroll. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a good trade-off. So again, having that understanding of what does your cash flow look like? Can I utilize some supplier discounts in order to, you know, sort of build in some profit or lock in some pricing so that I can confidently quote um, out to, to my customers? That's excellent, excellent points, Heather. I was thinking that as you were speaking that, you know, we, we got all into the whole just-in-time inventory uh, mindset. And, you know, when, time, when times are tough like this and the prices are changing so much, that might not be the right way to run your business anymore. But it does really depend on having the cash flow to be able to manage holding and a carrying an inventory, but you can sometimes get some pricing that's a little bit better if you buy more because the shipping costs now are over, uh, you know, a larger it's the economies of scale on your shipping costs, you might be able to save some money, but you have to be able to have the cash flow to manage that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I had another question actually come in um, through the chat here that I'm going to ask, and I have a feeling cash flow is going to be part of your, your answer. <laughs> but um, the question from the audience is that my business had to borrow to float operations and purchases through COVID, which we, we've talked about. So, but this person wants to borrow to invest in growing their business, um, but they still have COVID-related debt. So is there a balance or can you offer some tips in how to balance servicing old debt while potentially taking on more to hopefully increase revenue. Yeah, I would say from from our perspective, if we're looking at financing that, you know, mm -hmm. we're looking at your ability to forecast. You know, historical revenue isn't necessarily going to be reflective of your business's ongoing ability to service new debt if it relates to a growth project or an in reinvestment into your business. So that being able to effectively forecast and articulate why you are seeing your business growing at X amount of rate or your ability to then repay that loan um, is certainly what we would look at and what we would sort of work with you to understand and make sure that, again, when we, for us anyways, when we're structuring that loan, that we're tying the repayment to that positive cash flow position when when that growth has actually attributed or been attributed to your bottom line um, so that I would say again it does it comes but down to your ability to understand your finances and effectively forecast because that debt is still debt it still needs to be paid <laughs> so that there are instances where that has become a challenge for some businesses right is that um, they took on debt, it is loaded that we know that the payment's gonna be there. And so we have to factor it in and it can take away from your ability to borrow going forward. So keeping that in mind. Gwyneth, Jeff, do you have anything to add? So, you know, the ba in balancing, and, and I don't know from a CPA uh, perspective, you know, balancing old debt, servicing old debt while taking on more. Uh, the idea of if this is like a growth project, as Heather was saying, or an asset, is that it would be generating enough income to pay off the debt on its own. I think that's what, and I think like Heather is saying that, and that you yeah. have to show like it's gonna. There's gonna be much more of an honest. Like if you didn't have that debt before. It's a lot easier to say to Heather, hey, I need to borrow something for this project. But if you already have debt, if you're already leveraged, it can be an issue. Um, but I think it's it's really about, okay, this this machine is going to produce this many widgets and it's going to give us the sale and it's going to end up with this much in the bottom line. And that's how you can show uh, something along those lines. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and then sometimes what people end up doing is doing a debt consolidation. Um, but if you don't want to consolidate in, for example, the SIBA loan balance, the 30 or 40,000 that you owe, not until the end of next year, which is currently interest free, that would be ridiculous to, to roll that in. So, you know, at the moment, you're just kind of having to balance the fact that there's going to be maybe a two or three different pieces of debt, one of which that's interest free leave that one alone and then try to manage the other two and then maybe consolidate everything if you can't manage to pay back SIBA at the end of next year because you don't want to have that all of a sudden be fully repayable uh, mm -hmm. at the total amount that you had borrowed rather than that free piece that you were able to take to income. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone else um, on the call has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat now. We do have one from the chat. Um, it's, it is a bit of a, a staffing and an HR question, but I'm going to pose it to the panel anyway, um, because I think there may be some, some financial part of this, especially for Jeff, uh, Gwyneth and, and Jeff. So the question is um, on staffing for recovery and growth. Um, you know, businesses are having difficulty in securing qualified full-time employees. Are there any risks for small businesses, or should we be wary of utilizing staffing that is more uh, semi-retired or contract employees, um, not under full-time contract conditions? So in terms of paying them, tax implications, you know, your year end, um, I'm wondering if there's anything from a financial perspective that you can share um, on this question. Um, yeah, definitely. One of the biggest things that you need to have in place if you're going to take on somebody who maybe isn't even going on payroll, they're going to be an independent contractor, is you have to have a solid contract with that person. Because if they cannot be proven to be independent enough from your operations and things sour, they could walk into EI and say, well, I really was an employee. And then you'll have Service Canada coming after you for all of the payroll taxes you didn't pay. So really, really important that you in, ensure that they are, in fact, an independent contractor. They maybe supply their own tools. They work hours that they more or less structure themselves. They, you know, there, there's this, this sense that they are not an integral part of your operation um, so that you don't end up having that relationship and that, that set up sour. Um, but I, I personally think, you know, using a, so sort of a semi-retired or self-employed person who comes in and does some work with you is, is a great way to get past this, this period of time where we're having so much trouble finding qualified staff. Uh, but you just need to make sure you manage it properly. That would be the only thing I'd have to say about that. Thank you. Jeff, I'm, do you have anything else you'd like to add? That pretty much covers it. Yeah, you have to watch out that and employee versus contractor relationship, especially where it's a lot easier to fire a contractor or to let go of a contractor than it is to let go of an employee. Uh, it's also, as Gwyneth said, a short-term fix. So it's something where I know this has been a complaint for pretty much, like it's not industry specific. Everyone's having trouble finding people right now. Mm -hmm. So you do what you can, but yeah, make sure you have your I's dotted and your T's crossed. Excellent. Um, I don't think we have anything more from the chat. Is there anything quickly um, any of you would like to add before um, for the people on the call? No. You guys have all dropped off your personal taxes with your accounts by now, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> the, the, de the deadline's Monday if you're not self-employed, so just, just be careful. <laughs> you're going to be late for some money at CRA and buy yourself some time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today, and I'm going to pass things back over to Tiffany from Peterborough and the Corthus Chamber of Commerce. Excellent, fantastic information today, panelists. Thank you so much. So insightful. I love the little tidbits we can take kind of through throughout the year. Uh, really, really great advice. So thank you for carving out time with us today. Uh, Hillary, our partners with Peterborough and the Kawartha's Economic Development. Uh, thank you to you and your team today. I really appreciate you, you moderate, moderating and walking us through this discussion. Uh, so big shout out to all of you, everybody in the room. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, once again, a big 
shout out to our summit sponsor, the Business Development Bank of Canada, BDC. Uh, you can check them out for information. They have a couple pre-recorded webinars uh, on the summit page, as well as the keynote speaker from Monday. I highly, highly recommend you check out that uh, chief economist, uh, Pierre Clarou, was just truly remarkable. Uh, check it out. A uh, big shout out to our profile sponsor, Nexacom, and of course, our knowledge sponsors, Microwage, Peterborough Whitby, and Lynn Woodcroft, Royal LePage, Frank Real Estate. We appreciate your support with the Business Summit this week. Uh, mark your calendars. Tomorrow, we've got a couple other things going on. 12 o'clock, we're going out to Buckhorn to do some networking at Pizza Aloro. Their pizza is so good. You have to come out. 12 o'clock, Buckhorn. Meet us out on the patio. It's going to be a beautiful day. Um, and tomorrow at 2 o'clock, uh, we have a workshop on business succession planning. What if? Uh, heavy conversation, good information. Get your questions answered. It's serious business. Uh, and that is happening at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Watch your inbox, 6 a.m. We send out the Business Summit email every single day with the uh, links that you need uh, for the rest of the week. So stay tuned. If you need anything, reach out to your Peterborough and the Corthus Chamber of Commerce, Peterborough and the Corthus Economic Development. We've got your backs for business. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take good care, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.